All right, so you're in the um, this session on design validation, AKA how to suck less. Um, that's what's printed in the schedule. Um, it's, it's actually kind of a working title, so um, I think meaningful design feedback is more the approach I'm going for, but anyway. So you're here because you're interested in collecting design feedback, um, maybe using it to your, for your site and you know, just ensuring it happens in some form. Um, so in this session, we'll define what design feedback is and how to collect it, how to use it, that sort of thing. Um, and also, I'd just like to thank these people. They really helped with my session. I, d I did a lot of like chatting with them. And, and the other thing I did is I did uh, a run through of my session and they had some great feedback. And I'm a big fan of feedback. I asked them to focus on the content and the flow and because I don't get terribly excited by fonts. So the great feedback. Okay, so um, my name is Lisa Rex. I'm a user experience researcher at Acquia. Um, formerly a sort of design editor. I've done front end. I've done some site, Drupal site building. Um, I was also a genealogy researcher, which has been a kind of interesting juxtaposition with my current role. Um, but some of my biggest failures in my design career have been because I didn't get the right design feedback. Um, the story that springs to mind is uh, my actually my first sort of like web design role. I was tasked with building the internet. And <laughs> it's hard. And, and so my friend and I, we kind of got together and we, and we ran down to the kitchen and we made toast and we you know, were all excited and we, we, we built the whole thing and then you know, we showed it to people and we kind of missed the mark on <laughs> content and visuals and yeah, and the whole thing was scrapped. So good lesson there. Um, so this is the design team at Acquia. Um, we're definitely focused on products, things like Acquia Cloud, Acquia Network, Commons, Spark, Drupal Gardens. And you know, our, our process, this, this is the story basically of our process. And um, it's definitely, our process is a work in progress, but we're like, we're growing, we're learning, we're adapting, and it's, it's actually really quite fun, so. Um, these are our UX interaction designers. Their, their focus is largely on sort of the visual and the interactive part of things. Uh, they do a lot of the design briefs and style guides. Um, and then they also do like the visuals and the prototypes and that's everything from, you know, wireframes to uh, clickable prototypes. So we're, we have lots of approaches to the way we do things and, that's, and we just decide based on the needs of the project and timelines. Um, and then there's the UX research team, and there's three of us at the moment. Uh, we are doing the research planning and conducting the studies. Uh, we do a lot of like sort of more basic studies, like kind of like click tests, if that seems appropriate. Um, and you know, we're we're actually talking a lot with our customer-facing team, so support and um, the account technical account managers. So I mean, this comes together with. Um, our, our, our feedback process is pretty, pretty broad. We are mostly focused on the uh, qualitative and not the quantitative. So it's great to like use uh, Google Analytics or Clicktail or anything like that to see where people are clicking, but it doesn't tell you the why of things, so that's why we're more focused on actually talking to people directly. Um, so design feedback is anything from you know, written emails to tweets, but um, actually we'd prefer uh, like, you know, actual conversations with you know, our stakeholders and users and potential users. So yeah, everything from gut reactions to really planned studies. Um, the reason for this is that we, you know, we recognize that we are not necessarily our users and, and, and that's the same for everybody. You, know, you can't know what your users need until you talk to them. So um, lots of things you can learn from feedback. Um, one of the things I find really useful is the figure out the actual needs of your users. So your brand new user, he comes to your site, um, things might be a little difficult to figure out, but you know, maybe over time it's learnable. The next time he comes, he's like whizzing through, great. Um, and then we have the power users. You know, she comes along and she's been using your site or your product for a long time and you know, she doesn't need all this kind of like introductory stuff. So it's working out like how their needs vary. Um, this is kind of a fun example from, um, it's the drupal.org admin, uh, it's the user permissions page. 
So <laughs> it's not public facing, but I think it's fun because most people don't get to see it. Uh, you know, obviously what works for like a few doesn't always work, doesn't scale. So that's what I mean by scalability. I mean like in the UI and you see this a lot on forums and other social sites occasionally. Um, but if you, as you probably know, the Devel module will let you like generate like reams of content and stuff it into your theme and make sure nothing breaks. So nodes and comments and users. Um, the other thing that you can learn is just whether your content is actually working. This is a big deal. Um, that's the main pe reason people are coming to your to your site or coming to your project. Um, you know, just figuring out like what's the right amount and what they need is is the messaging right? Are they you know, is the tone working for them? You know, maybe they're I don't know. Maybe it's like you're talking down to them or you know, there's all kinds of things you can learn. And then the other thing is sort of like the UI text. So that's things like on your forms and you know, just labeling can be confusing unless you check with people. So um, I approached this talk like I did, like I would a, a, a research project. And I, so I talked to nine different people. Um, seven of them were actual designers from around the Drupal community and, and, at, and at Acquia. And I also talked to two product managers because I thought they would have an interesting take on things. So yeah, I, I did interviews with them and I looked for some common themes. Um, so here's, here's well first, first um, some, a quote from my colleague who's just super smart. Um, he points out that you know, feedback is the sort of difference between design and art. So with that in mind, I was like, yep. <laughs> Uh, okay, so common themes for my interviews with these people. Uh, number one is that design feedback is absolutely essential. And what's interesting is not all of them start out off thinking that way. Uh, you know, in, their, in, your, in your career as a designer, you might think you, you've got it all figured out. But um, <laughs> one, of the, one, one of them said, like, you know, as often as I think I'm right, I'm usually not. So it happens. Um, and then the, the kind of the main reason that feedback is essential is that it just saves time. Like the faster you can like uncover problems before you start getting other people involved, like you know, making putting stuff into code, the better. So um, talk talk is cheap. <laughs> um, it's not always what they say, it's what they do. Um, so this major airline, they decided that they would survey customers to find or you know their passengers to find out how they could improve their long haul flights. And in the survey, one of the questions was, um, what sort of snack would you like mid-flight? And the overwhelming response was fruit. So the researchers thought, well, let's ask the flight attendants. So they did. And the flight attendants were like, no, 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 no. They want cookies, warm cookies. So <laughs> the researchers thought about this. And they, they kind of, I think they realized that they're passengers were saying, saying that they wanted fruit, but they were probably at home, surrounded by family, um, thinking about being healthy and, you know, safe. And it just, it was interesting, like, how you want to be able to observe your users, not just ask them, so. Um, the other thing that we learned from these talks is that um, during design feedback sessions, people don't know quite how to behave. They don't know what to say. <laughs> they say too much. So um, I'll talk about how we can deal with that. Um, OK, so you may be familiar with this meme. <laughs> People see inspirational photos of like you know baking projects that professionals have done uh, on Pinterest. It turns out it's harder than it looks. <laughs> um, so people tend to think of themselves as a designer. And, you know, Turns out it's really quite hard. <laughs> um, so if you're gathering feedback with people, um, just a little tip on reining in the, the designer and everybody. <laughs> um, there's, there's a few reasons. Like, it's wonderful that they have ideas and like, t definitely take them all down. But uh, at the same time, you know, they probably don't have all the information they need, such as like, um, if there's been some existing research or um, design patterns or anything like that. Um, the other thing is that a flat design, just like a drawing or something, it may not, it probably doesn't have all the interactions, so that, that your, the designer still has work to do, even if someone hands over a drawing. Um, and then the main thing is that they could have, 
found, spend that time finding other problems. Um, so one of, one of the people I talked to, she used the phrase monkey hands, like design monkey hands. Don't make me think I'm like just these monkey hands. <laughs> so let your designer be the designer. Um, okay, so let's talk about actually getting meaningful design feedback. Okay, let's say your client or your stakeholder says, hey, let's make a thing. Um, and for the purposes of this, we'll say it's a homepage redesign. So, as I mentioned before, everyone wants to feel like they're part of this successful design thing. So, it's great. It's super great. Definitely, definitely, like, get, get your team involved. Um, we, we encourage the support. We get a representative from support, uh, from QA. Uh, definitely, the designers, even if it's not the lead designer, I mean, including the lead designer, but the other, their peers tech leads, developers, it's great. Get everyone involved. Um, and marketing, too. So one of the first things we do is we start with a creative brief. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because you've probably seen these before, but these are the headings in our creative brief. So we talk about um, what the problems are, like what, you know, what it is we're trying to solve, and then sort of the goals of the project. And that's super important. Get everyone aligned on those. Uh, Success criteria, dependencies. Dependencies are things like if you're, you know, the, the one of the developers isn't available until a certain time. So anything that could introduce risk to the situation. Um, and, then, and then kind of break down the aspects of this design or this new feature or whatever. Um, the must-haves, the should-haves, and whatnot. So the must-haves, this is interesting because the story or the, the project can't be considered ready to ship until all the must-haves are met. And the should-haves are things that you could release without it, but then you won't be done until you've done those. Um, also, must-not-have. So there's probably instances where it just it shouldn't have something in, in there, so be sure to declare that up front. We also talk about who our competitors are. That's just, so it's just an awareness thing. Um, and then any deadlines and who, who you're targeting and inspiration, so I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then notes, just, you know, people can take notes as you have these reviews. So we um, recently released these um, notifications up here, and like, you know, some of our inspiration for these things, we're looking at like Facebook and LinkedIn and Jira, Twitter, you know. It's a, a well-established design pattern now, so it's, it's helpful to like look at that for inspiration. And then I mentioned success criteria. Just here's some examples, um, you know, starting with sort of like something vague, like, you know, higher conversion rate, or, you know, as an example. You know, we like to say, we like to make them like smart goals, and that's like um, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So here it's just like, you know, from two to five by Q quarter four, and I've just made these things up, but just as an example. So um, now let's say um, you're working on your you know, design brief. At the same time, you want to start looking and thinking about your feedback and research plan. Don't, don't be tempted to skip this step. It's really, really important. Um, so again, these are headings from the document for the research planning. We first talk about the goals. Uh, these will match, hopefully, to the goals of the design brief. Um, then we um, take, take input from the stakeholders. And your stakeholders are, you know, whoever the product owner is or the client. And that input could be things like, you know, what they want to learn or, you know, what, you know, if they want something kind of validated in particular. Um, the next thing is your methodology. So that can be anything from, you know, usability testing to one-on-one -on -one chats to um, if you just, you know, if you know you don't have a lot of time, then you just want to do something really fast or, you know, do the quick and dirty testing, absolutely fine. Uh, then, depending on those top three things, then you'll decide who your participants are and how you'll recruit them. And then lastly, it's just like, what, what are you asking? You know, and it's really helpful if you're, you know, talking to a series of people to have those questions written down. I mean, start with maybe a kind of an, an, a briefing for the, for the participant, you know, just introducing the study to them and 
and then, then all your questions and that sort of thing. So I don't know if you've ever had a situation where people couldn't agree, but possibly. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the great techniques I just learned from my colleague Christine is this KJ method. And it's really super for getting people all kind of to reach consensus. So let's, let's say that um, the, the, you just wanted to find out like what research goals or what, what, how to focus the research for something. So what you do is you get everybody in a group with, the, with this KJ method, everyone in a group, and you ask them the focus question. So for example, we ask like, what would you like to learn about customers in the next quarter? And everyone who's participating will write down all of their answers <laughs> on a sticky note and uh, put them all randomly on the wall. And then as a group, they sort the sticky notes into like categories that could sort of make sense. And um, you know, anything that, you know, related. And then the next step is they um, label, this, label these groupings and then they vote on them. So they can have three votes. So three X's for their number one and you know, so on. And then at the end, you can just um, add up and see which groups won. So, and there, there you have it. Like you know, everyone worked together. Um, they had opportunities to um, change groups, mix up groups, and you can read more about it. There's a, a link here. Um, Jared Spool wrote a great article. Um, also, in your sort of recruiting methodology, you want to think about who do you need to make happy. So. For people in the agency setting, it's going to be probably heavily client-centric. Your, your clients are the ones who are paying the bills, and that's who you need to make happy. They, they have their business objectives and that sort of thing. Um, Paul Boag is another designer who has um, written, and he's podcasted and has an ebook about this client-centric approach. So I would um, check that out if you get a chance, if that's of interest. Um, and then obviously there's the user-centric approach, and I think for most people it, it's going to be a mix of the two. So you decide like you know what that mix is. I mean at Acquia we definitely we definitely do a mix. Um, so okay, now let's say that you know the design brief has been signed off, and design begins. Uh, again, get everyone involved. <laughs> so um, in this example we. We started off with like I think 12 people, and we had we divided up into three groups, and we started drawing, making sketches, and like sort of over a couple sessions, you know, it, it took several hours, but we we got there, and we distilled it down into two kind of quite robust drawings. Um, and I realized this photo that uh, one of my colleagues put a bird on it, and so if you watch Portlandia, I think it's Portlandia, and if you. In, they say in Portland, if you put a bird on it, you can just call it art. So anyway, I left that in. <laughs> uh, oh, per, put a bird on it. Dot com, in case you <laughs> need an emergency bird. Um, so now, let's talk about the research execution. So your designer has something to show you and to show others. So what we usually do is start with the stakeholders, and you know the, these the stakeholders are the people that have like specific you know, deadlines and goals, and so they're going to care about all these things and any, any, any like design changes that are going to impact timelines and budgets. So we tend to do sort of three different things. Um, design reviews, um, design check-ins, which are just sort of shorter and more frequent, and then we use like commenting tools. Um, but first let me talk about uh, design reviews. So this is where this is where things can get go awry. <laughs> um, so the best thing is if, if you're the one who's like leading the session, you want to set expectations up front. So um, if you have an hour, just like explain like we're going to spend 10 minutes going through the design brief, then we're going to spend 30 minutes, you know, talk actually getting your feedback, and then the, la the last time it will like think about like what's the sort of next steps. Um, so yeah, always. I think it's a great idea to go through the, the design brief together just to remind everybody like what the goals are, you know, that sort of thing. Um, as the person who's collecting the design feedback, you're going to sort of facilitate and take lots of notes um, and let the designer present his or her vision. Um, another quote from Matt, he's really quotable. <laughs> he, um, he said that, you know, a lot of, you'll get a lot of probably a lot of talk coming at you in these sessions and you just have to like 
you know, as a designer and as the facilitator, you'll learn to kind of focus on what's important. So, actionable, feed, actionable feedback. Uh, sometimes there can be opinion wars, um, but what you want to do is just ask them to focus on, on the problems and the goals and, and not focus on any solutions, or try not to jump to any solutions yet, because that comes later, and actually that's really the, design, the designer's job. Um, a good example is if you were doing a car design, you'd want the feedback to focus on things like the brakes and the steering wheel and not the headrest. Um, if, if, if the design review isn't working, you know, you can have like shorter, more frequent check-ins, like I think maybe every other day might be good, and then have like one sort of mandatory session once a week um, just to get, you know, avoid any surprises. Um, the other thing we use is something called InVision, and I think there's other similar products out there, but it allows you to just upload a bunch of static screens and link them together. So you have a sort of clickable prototype, and uh, people can add comments directly to the screen, so it's like nice and in context. And th this is, um, well, this is the, the sort of the back-end view, I guess you could say. But we used it for commons, and because we also needed like public, you know, the community comments, so we, we used this and it worked out really, really great. Um, so. so now I want to talk a little bit about actually talking to users. Um, Christine says that the, the best way to understand their goals and attitudes is to have people watch, um, when I say people, watch, you know, your, watch people using your products. So, I mean, getting like a developer in a room to watch and take notes is really, really powerful. Um, so yeah, they'll, they'll definitely understand what people need. Um, so I think of user feedback as like that harsh, glorious feedback from the only people who can like really make your design better. Um, they're in a really good position to tell you um, what needs improvement. Um, users are always coming somewhere with a purpose, and you know that's what you're going to uncover. Um, the other thing is that I think most people are really happy to provide feedback. Um, I've never, I've, I've, I always ask in person and I rarely get a no, but um, people are motivated to help and they like to help and, and if it's something they have to use frequently then they'll probably be really, really happy to do so. Um, the Drupal community I know is just really passionate and it's just, it comes through in a lot of different ways. Um, also customer hugs are awesome, I have to say. <laughs> Um, so, you're gonna like need to find these people to talk to. Uh, it can be people off the street, but it really, you know, it's like thinking about like what your goals are, and, and in your um, your process, you are also t thinking about who you need to talk to and how you're gonna recruit. But uh, that's why I mentioned asking in person, um, thinking about if, if you need to talk to just designers or developers or you know whatever type of person that is. Uh, and also in, offer incentives. So it could be anything like, we, we do I, Amazon gift cards, um, but you know maybe you just buy them lunch or coffee, beer, they all work. Um, and then just make it a conversation, make it fun. So, so you have your users or you have your customers or whoever it is that you want to talk to that's not the stakeholder. And the next thing is to think about whether you want to do in person or like remote. Um, I prefer in person just because it's easier to sort of establish like a rapport and um, it is a little more fun. <laughs> um, it's easier to communicate as well. There's a lot of nonverbal communication that goes on when you're face to face with people. And also it's a little easier to deal with interruptions. I, I had uh, the doorbell ring once and it scared me a lot and uh, they didn't know what was going on and they kept talking and so yeah, that sort of thing. Um, the cons of trying to do it in person are the logistics um, if, if you're not in the same place, then there's going to be travel and that sort of thing. But, uh, so remote, we do a lot of remote, I, I have to say. So we use things like um, Skype or WebEx. And it's just, it's just convenient, you know. All you have to do is really schedule them and, you know, hope they have a, everyone has like a good Wi-Fi connection. Um, but sometimes there, there's issues with the, audio and sort of things like that. So, but, you know. 
<clears throat> so what can you do with customers? So aside from doing like usability studies and um, just like interviewing them and getting their feedback, you can also do things like um, validating their priorities. So we did this recently. We, we showed them some roadmap items in a spreadsheet and we had them like record you know, their responses. I mean, I think what we did is we said, pretend you have $100, how would you allocate this? And we did that. We just, you know, hid the previous participants' columns, and um, it was really, really great. And I think we will definitely do that again. <laughs> um, so usability studies. Um, just a word. This is probably the area I know the most about. But usability studies is, is roughly like you're sitting them down. They're using your site or your product, and you're asking them questions. It can be really open-ended. You could start off with like. Uh, sit to, like do whatever you would do normally if you first encounter a site, uh, and then you might um, have them do a few specific tasks. But what I what I think is great is just to have them like give them a goal and just see what, where they go, how they get there, um, record all the sort of deviations and hesitations and that sort of thing. What, yeah, just definitely watch what they're doing. Um, I've observed people like clicking in one spot. Even though they weren't saying anything, they kept. They were. I saw this like clicking happening. I was like, okay, that could be a <laughs> that could be a problem. Um, and then the other thing is to um, use measurable metrics. So at Acquia, we've been doing everything on a one to five scale. So one is poor and five is excellent. So uh, as I observe, I'll I'll come up with the rating from from the effectiveness point of view, and then I'll often ask the participant like. Um, kind of like how was your experience and and what's funny and it's pretty consistent if I observe something to be like a, a three or a four they'll be like oh that was a five so like oh that's nice but you don't have to <laughs> protect my feelings um, the other thing also is just to communicate your findings visually uh, reports are, are really boring and your stakeholders are likely not going to read them so I always uh, I like to do sort of annotated screenshots, um, or, or if you've been recording, you can take video clips, and that's awesome. So if you are doing usability studies, what's really great is just to start setting up repeatable ones. So if something changes in the, in the design, you can run the study again and see how it alters. Like, and it, but it's, if it's exactly the same as it was before, you can just see if it went up. <laughs> Hopefully it went up. Um, also, um, some of our studies where we ha have people like actually editing content on a Drupal site uh, just to test things out. And you can use something that, uh, if you have a Drupal site on a multi-environment um, multi hosting provider, you can use that to just like revert the database back so it just resets to where it was. That's a big time saver. <laughs> um, and if you have any kind of studies where they're like actually altering settings on modules, you can use Drush to just revert back to the default. So a um, couple pro tips. Always, always keep your stakeholders involved. Um, don't, don't go it alone either. <laughs> I always think it's great if you can get someone else on your team to um, come in and observe and take notes. And you know, then afterwards, you can be like, hash it all out and like, what happened? You know? <laughs> so, um, and then always record, record your conversations with your, with your participants. Uh, WebEx is, is what we're usually using, but if, if you have to, just use you know, the thing on your phone or <clears throat> any kind of voice recorder. Um, the reason is that you know, it's, it's if for whatever reason your note taker you know, can't capture everything and you're trying to like, ask questions and listen and be able to come up with additional questions, you can't also take notes at the same time. It's, it's hard. I, can't, I wouldn't recommend it. So definitely record. A um, couple things if you're interested in learning more about usability testing or kind of UX, undercover UX is another great one. There's a couple books there and then this video, <clears throat> the square weave, um, it's called The User is Drunk and it shows uh, <laughs> some examples of um, pretending if your user is drunk then it'll help a little bit with like the design. I think it's funny, so. <laughs> um, and then, <clears throat> excuse me. Adam, Connor, and Aaron Irizarry, they, they talk about design critique a lot. And actually, they're 
presenting today at Web Visions, and I saw them last night. Um, th so there's a link there that I think is Adam talking about critique. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, they, they've, they've done a lot on that, so definitely look at that, because that feeds in quite nicely to the whole design reviews and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's say you've got all your, your research and you've got it and you're like happy, you've talked to enough people, that sort of thing. Now gather it all up and start like, you know, sort of synthesizing it, like look for the high level themes um, and then show these to stakeholders. So what, is a, what, it, one, one, what you can do is like sort of group everything by like sort of the original questions they may have had. And then um, as a group, you'll decide what to act on. Uh, I mean, this process does take a little bit of time, but if you focus on the big ones, like, you know, f forget about the things that maybe one person said or two people said, but if like, you know, five people have mentioned something, then it's definitely something that you want to focus on. Um, if you can't decide, you can always run a KJ again to decide like, you know, well, what are we going to act on? So that works too. So when you start gathering this information, you can do things like develop these sketch personas. And these really only come from having like a deep understanding of who your users are. Um, sort of the difference between a regular persona is that these are in flight. They're never, you know, we're always learning, so they're not final. Um, and how we've, we usually start with like the person's name and what they do, a little biography, a little bit of their day-to-day -day life. And we talk about their technical profile. So something like, you know, how, how well they know Drupal, do they use version control? Um, you know, are they comfortable in the command line? That sort of thing. And then task profiles. So these are the things they actually do on your site or your product or whatever. And I've broken them down into um, sort of primary and secondary. So another way you could break it down is like the sort of things that are crucial but less important and then the ones that they do all the time. And then just generally like their kind of concerns and challenges to do with their, their job. Security comes up a lot, that sort of thing. Um, what is great though is I've, once your team starts recognizing these names and these profiles, they really absorb it, then they become like able to defend this person. <laughs> so uh, I've seen that and it's really fun. Like, well, no, Dave would never do that because Dave, you know. So. <laughs> um, when I, and then I said mentioned like visually communicating. This is like an example of a journey map. And this is, an, uh, you know, it could just a map to one of your personas. But imagine there's all these tasks on your site. And, you know, after you've done usability testing, you know that certain tasks are frustrating, certain are happy, usable. <laughs> so, yeah, just you know, break them out. So like um, on the x-axis we have the one to five rating and then across the bottom we have the phases. And these phases, you know, they're going to depend on your, your project. But, uh, and, you know, phase one might be like brand new user, the first time they encounter it. And then like phase three is like, you know, they're like there every day, so. So now, um, you've got your design feedback, you've identified the problems. And now you got to act on it. So I think the hardest thing is like to actually just commit to a percentage of your time, of the of the you know the development team's time, to actually incorporate the feedback. Um, it's always tempting to for them to they're probably really excited to work on new stuff, but um, it's going to be important that they kind of work on the things that are making the site better too. Um, so that feedback you'll just want to translate it into just chunks of work. Um, again, like. You'll you want to prioritize those and get them on the development schedule. So I think it might be a little early here, but <laughs> your turn. So I want, I want to see if people um, have done any design validation. Has anyone done this before or feedback, usability testing? A few. Yeah. OK. Good. Um, yeah, so just think about a, a project, the thing, the parts you're not sure about, um, what you can do. I, I'd, love to, I'd love it if people came back to me like sometime later and they said that they, they ran some, some feedback and got some good information, that'd be great. Um, 
We are also, um, we're also doing ongoing usability studies on our products on Drupal, um, where, where there's this, a, a greater sort of UX, Drupal UX team. So if you're interested in doing anything like that, um, for the Acquia side, there's a URL there. So that definitely sign up or come talk to me. Um, and then for the Drupal side, uh, we're actually having a boff today at 2.15. I forgot the room, but it's on the board. And you can um, learn if you want to like, become part of the, the team that's improving and growing Acquia's UX, that would be great. So we've, we've identified a lot of the problems with the current process of you know, contributing to Drupal UX. And, and now we're looking for people to help like, come up with solutions. And I think the answer is going to be um, like doing more work at the local level. So if we can empower people who want to do UX, like they could do like a run, run a usability study at a, a camp or something, that would, be, that would be amazing. So, but anyway, I think we'll get together and we'll brainstorm some ideas there. So um, that's all I have. But if anyone has any questions, you can come up with the microphone. Can you explain the process that you go through when it comes to um, accessibility and uh, people with visual impairments when you are you know, trying to de um, decide what your clients priorities are and what how to bring them down to earth that way it's more you know accessible okay so the question was um, how do we do accessibility feedback and balance the, the clients priorities versus do you, are you what's your what's what is your clients priorities like are they are they concerned with accessibility or not yes of course they are they are concerned okay. with it yeah we have it it's a pretty big deal at the university where I work at okay um, for um, the visually impaired especially. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, we don't, I don't, that's not a thing I work on at the moment, but in previous roles, we would, uh, you know, just build in time to do accessibility um, testing. And so that was, you know, just like making sure it could run on the screen readers. Um, I mean, actually, it was started off by just, you know, there's a lot of, like, online tools to, to check it. But, sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say just try to um, make sure there's time and, and get the team. I mean, that would be part of the design brief, I would imagine. So Did you guys ever have, like, or ever have actual blind people or, say, older folks try and, or any uh, testing in that regards? Um, we've, so for, well, for Drupal, we have. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So they, there's, we, go ahead. Did you find that valuable? Yes, yeah, no, they uncovered a lot of problems. Um, I know like right now there's a views issue right now about the, um, I think it's about the, something like the tables and the descriptions, so. Yes, yeah. yes, there is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Hi. Hi. Um, so what would your advice be for dealing with a client that says, we already do design validation. We have you know, 4C or one of those other you know, pop-up things that comes up on your site that says rate the site experience from one to five. How do you explain to them, well, there might be something more to get from design validation than just sure. one to five ranking? So um, the question is like if the, the client says they already do design validation because they have something popping up on the screen and asking them to rate the experience. Well, the first question is like what kind of what kind of responses are they getting? You know, what percentage of users are actually clicking? You know, are, why are, would they be motivated to do so? And then the other thing to ask them is like, what are you learning from that? And they might learn, they might learn that, oh, well, you know, it's getting a, l a low rating, but they don't know why. So the whole thing with like this sort of qualitative design feedback is you can get at the why, why things are, or why people feel why blue doesn't work or whatever. So yeah, so just try to see if, the, if they say no, I don't want to know why that's a problem, then <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Hello, I have two questions. Uh, the okay. first one is uh, what percentage of user testing do you do on the admin side versus like the non-admin side? And then also how do you incorporate uh, feedback that you get from social media like Twitter and stuff like that into the design process? Okay, so the question was, don't run away. <laughs> I'm going to just double check. So the first question was, um, 
the sort of public facing versus the admin yeah. testing? Okay. So for something like commons, we, <clears throat> we definitely need to test the admin interface because the whole, like the people who are going to be downloading and evaluating commons are the people who will have to set up the site. So um, we haven't gotten into a ton of that yet, but so I'd say for something like commons, it'll be some like, I don't know, 60, 40 maybe, 40% 40 admin, 60% public, something like that. Um, yeah, and then for something like, you know, um, Acquia Cloud, it's all, you know, whatever the user interface is that the, the lead developer, whoever is using that, that's, that's like, we consider so, that public facing. So I'm, what I'm hearing is that it, it all just depends on the project, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and sorry, what was your second question? Social media. Yeah. Okay. So if someone like tweets and says something, what like, well, we just keep track of it. Like, you know, we've had, we've certainly had feedback that's come through in different formats, um, comments and tweets and things like that. But we want to kind of like make sure it comes into this greater pool of feedback because if it, like if we start hearing things over and over again, then, then we know it's a, it's a priority. And if it's just like a, a one-off, then, you know, we can't, we can't do everything. So just. Mm. Okay, thank yeah. you. You, how would you handle a situation where um, you have someone, a stakeholder, probably a manager or your CEO or someone like that in your organization who really wants things to be a certain way, really likes a certain feature or wants it to work a certain way, and your usability testing either goes contrary to that or isn't really indicate one way or the other? So, yeah. So how do you balance that out? Very carefully. <laughs> so yeah, the question is like, what happens if uh, a, a C, like someone higher up in the organization or a stakeholder wants things a certain way, but your your user testing and user feedback doesn't exactly match that? Um, well, you know, you can go back to like, what are the goals of the project? Um, think about you know what your success criteria is, and you know if the user testing doesn't like. Play out with you know the success criteria. Then then there's that's there's that. I mean the other thing is like you know they're not the end user. So if you can gently remind them <laughs> that you know. So I, I guess there's probably more you can do, but that's where I would start. Just you know explaining like well, we think it'll work better for these guys because. So does that answer your question? Yeah, as best as it can be answered, I think. It's okay, a tough if you situation. have specifics, we can talk afterwards. Okay. okay. I mean, there's also the point that sometimes they're just going to say no, and you're going to get have to accept that. That's sometimes they'll say no. Yeah, it that. definitely. Yeah. yeah. Dictators. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, how how does all this fit into a, an agile process? So um, when you do a design, does the whole thing have to be completely finished by the time you go into the first sprint, or do you kind of do parts of it and then um, implement some of it, say, in the, in the first sprint? And then the second question, because I think I know what the answer is to the first one, uh, how, how do you communicate to, that to the, to the client um, to make sure that they don't, um, it, you know, if they're used to working with old, more old-fashioned sort of waterfall mm -hmm. methods, how, how do you um, just give them the, uh, what's the word? How, how do you give them the uh, certainty that the whole thing is going to be finished by the end of the project without them actually seeing pretty much the whole finished project you know, in, in Photoshop mm. or something? OK, so working with um, Agile. Well, I'm glad you asked. That's a good point. I, um, we, I think you've got to, you've got to like sort of maybe set up some sort of milestones where you start showing them designs early so that there's, again, no nasty surprises. Mm. For a lot of stakeholders, it's hard for them to envision things at an early stage. So, you know, maybe maybe you don't, yeah, I guess it depends on your stakeholders. But I mean, I would definitely like start showing them things earlier if possible, because then if it's starting to go in the wrong direction, you can make that correction. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in terms of like sort of hitting those milestones, like that's why you have like in our design briefs, we have the must haves and the should haves and the nice to haves. Yeah. So focus on the must haves first and that way if you run out of time, you're not like, you know, it's not going to be a disaster. It's just, yeah. you know, 
Okay. It'll be something that you, maybe you just work on it. In the do, you, do you work at a relatively early stage with um, like Photoshop designs, or do you go to like go to the uh, customer with wireframes, or how, how do you do that? And then how, and then how do yeah. you communicate to them that? Um, I'm just thinking sort of out of personal experience a bit. Um, uh, a bit of an issue with if you do if they do have properly layouted power, um, PowerPoint uh, uh, Photoshop designs, um, how you kind of tell them well this bit's f finished, this bit is kind of in the open, and um, I, I, fi I find it my diff difficult myself um, mm -hmm. like working with designers when you sort of think, hang on, which bit of this is actually uh, settled and which bit of it is still open. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's designs are always in flight. I mean, we we. We have our stakeholders are all internal um, for the most part, and we'll start off with uh, well, we, like like this recently, we we actually had them drawing with us, so okay. that was that was actually pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then from there, it gets translated into um, um, uh, we started doing like kind of in parallel with two designers, one person doing like the the Photoshop uh, or fireworks, I should say, you know, really like detailed, and then one person doing the the, eight, the sort of uh, more interactive code prototype at the same time, and then kind of like they, they come together. So that was that was tricky because people are like, well, which part should I pay attention to? So. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. All right. Thanks. That's really sure. interesting. Anybody else? A quick question that might be is related to the discussion we just had. Um, how do you, uh, how um, are uh, customers and clients uh, ready to pay for usability? How do you put that in your offers and how do you price it, etc.? Sure. Uh, I mean, so that 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 isn't a thing we do at, at Acquia, but in previous roles, we would in my previous job, we would, you know, strongly encourage it because it was like. You have a better chance of success. This project will be more successful if we can take the time and show it to users. You know, take their feedback, incorporate it, and I don't know. It's a, it's a balance. I mean, sometimes it gets cut from the budget, but you know, I don't. I almost don't see how how any sane person would want to cut that. You know, you might just scale it back, but you can't. I don't think it's a great idea to. And at Acquia, do you, um, do, you do it differently there? Yeah, at Acquia, so. It's it is part of the process. It just is and because it's the product. You do the because you develop the products or also for clients. Yeah, no, we're only we're only internal. We don't okay. do usability for clients. But yeah, so but okay. yeah, everyone's ex pretty accepting of that. <laughs> Thanks. Sure.